Okay, we are uh, on January 19th, 2022, our, our session on temple and synagogue. And uh, just last Shabbat, there was this hostage situation of a synagogue in Texas, and the rabbi uh, attributed, you know, a, a, a lot of the successful outcome to his training. Um, so there, there's a lot of different sources of of entities that have trained synagogue and staff. I'm actually, I haven't, I don't think I've attended any of them. I'm actually going to be attending one in February. It'll, it'll be virtual. I know that many synagogues, including Adad Elohim, mm -hmm. have spent considerable sums of money. And I think they even have a add-on to dues for synagogue security. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I saw something from Temple Beth Torah in in, um, in Ventura, along similar lines. So there's a lot of concern. And, and you know, one of the issues, and it's a Jewish value, is, I, again, I, you know, I've actually been following this very closely. I don't know the rabbi specifically, but Rabbi Diamond tells me he knows this rabbi. And I, I, have, I have good friends who are classmates of the rabbi. And, the, you know, the, the the interesting thing for me is there were like four people attending Saturday morning services. Like many places, it was, you know, a people's option to, to attend virtually or to, to attend in person. And apparently either before the service or early in the service, this guy was, was just knocking on the door and the rabbi invited him in, actually made him a cup of tea. So it almost sounds yeah. like to me, it would have been before services and spent some time talking with him uh, and uh, said, you know, he didn't seem quite right, but he said, and boy, did this ring true. He says, a lot of people had come knocking on our door don't seem quite right. Um, and apparently the guy was there for several hours before he pulled out a gun. And from what I understand, you know, it went on, the whole thing went on like 11 hours and toward the end of it, the rabbi got a sense that the guy was getting more and more agitated. So he kind of signaled the two remaining other hostages kind of to get ready to run. And he threw a chair at this, this guy and they managed to escape. He so, let one, uh, the guy let one hostage go. So yeah, one hostage was, was released a few hours before this. Yeah. So the, the thing that I'm so impressed about this rabbi is that how he kept his cool. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he, he used a phrase in one of the interviews that I've seen many times, and I remember from my training as counselor, to be a non-anxious presence. But um, there's one thing about being a non-anxious presence when somebody in my congregation is telling me about their problems. I can do that. When that somebody has a gun and holding me hostage, I don't know how you remain a non-anxious presence. So, so it's... Uh, the, the interesting question for me is, is the value of admitting strangers and having the synagogue open. You know, many synagogues now keep their doors locked during services, have closed circuit TV. Um, the door was locked, he let him in. And I remember, you know, a couple of years ago when I was still leading services in Ojai, the, the board decided to keep the door locked once services began. And I don't think we even had a like a peephole so people could see who was coming. And um, you know that, that really bothered me because if people are late to services in Ojai, it's not 100% clear that they would be let in. Now there was typically a board member who if somebody knocked on the door, he would open the door and let the person in, sort of defeating the purpose of locking it in the first place. So it's, it is a, you know, it's a, it's a serious issue. And pulpit rabbis are more than a little concerned these days about how to handle it and, and what you can do about it, short of having, you know, armed people in, in the synagogue. Um, yeah, you don't want to. So it, 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 it's not, uh, it, it's, it is a difficult situation. Um, and I, you know, I greatly admire this rabbi. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so uh, since we're talking about synagogue, I'm going, uh, Marlene, do you, do you wanna add something? Um, I'm forwarding you an email from my temple that has, that's for in February, the, it's their pers uh, personal resilience training for mm -hmm. te temple, well, for board members and for everybody who wants to do it. I'm gonna forge it to you okay. now and you can send it to everybody at this yeah. thing in a minute, okay? Okay, okay. Thank it's you. Free. Thank you. February. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to put on, uh, I'm going to start the screen share. And looks like it's working okay. So Temple and Synagogue, Home and Kashrut. We're actually entering into the final section of our studies called Living a Jewish Life. Again, acknowledging the, whoops, sorry, the uh, Jewish Federation who supports my work and thanking you for those of you who have made contributions to the Federation. And as always, you can find these materials on my website. Okay, so there's, all, there's actually a lot to cover. So I actually wanna talk about two different things, the temple in Jerusalem, and then the temple in your neighborhood or the synagogue in your neighborhood. So we think of, of the temple synagogues and so on, certainly the temple in Jerusalem as a holy place. But, but it's interesting as you read the, certainly the biblical text, the first thing and the only thing that's holy in the story of creation is time. It says, God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, hallowing, making it holy. The word Kodesh is in there. Um, as, as you know, in the story, God gives Abraham the land, but it's not described as a holy land. And in rabbinic tradition, the tabernacle, which is the portable temple in the desert, um, is required only after the incident of the golden calf, when God realizes that the people need physical expressions of the sacred. Um, the idea is initially only time is holy, but this is sort of a concession, at least according to the rabbis, uh, never mind that the temple actually is in the text before the worship of the holy calf, the rabbis don't worry about what's before and after, but as a concession to, um, to the way people are used to worshiping gods, we have the, the temple and sacrifice and so on. Uh, Bryce, I see your planet, but I don't see you, but I do see your... Uh, but I'm, but I, yet I'm, I am here and I just wanted to speak. Ah, oh. I've appeared. Okay. So the, uh, just very briefly, this is, in a sense, this is a proof. I don't know you would call it a proof text. Depends on what the text says. But that God does not know everything and does not completely understand people. Yeah, I, and, and, and there's lots. I mean, to me, it's, I understand, it's, yes. it, yeah, it's another example. For me, the proof text I always use is Genesis 6-6, where mm -hmm. it says God regretted having made humankind. So... End of but the if you story. need more ammo, here it is. Yeah, and and the point is, and it's again something I repeat over and over again, is the Bible is not really concerned with theology, which would be an orderly presentation of our understanding of God and religion. Uh, the Bible, first of all, is 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 a mythology. It's it's our sacred story, and it's as you know as as we know, it's composed of lots of different stories put together at different times. Uh, and then later in the Talmud, uh, the rabbis are going to be struggling to figure out what Jewish law ought to be. Uh, but so, so, so the Bible, Bible reaches its current form about 2000 years ago. Talmud reaches its current form about 1500 years ago. And it's only about 1000 years ago that you have Jewish philosophers trying to work out these issues of um, you know, of, of, of theology. Mick. I guess this is a bigger question, but like for you personally, where do you separate kind of like, I don't know if fact from fiction is the right terminology, but where do you separate, I guess, the slightly tangible from the slightly more mystical human created version of what we regard as religion, if that makes sense? Or this in so general. you're not talking about the Bible specifically, but religion in general. I guess in the Bible in specific, yeah. Like yeah, so that so there's a, a there's a very specific question 
and the technical term would be the historicity of the Bible. So the question would be, to what extent does the Bible reflect things that actually happen? Yes, that's, that's okay. it. Thank you. Okay. So on one hand, um, how do you know something has happened? Typically, you find confirmation outside, the, in this case, the Bible. So that confirmation can be in archaeology, and the confirm or the confirmation can be in in other written histories. And roughly speaking, that date is around the time of David and Solomon. There's very little archaeology or other histories. I'm just trying to keep track of some of the folks that are attending. There's very little um, archaeology or history of anything before David and Solomon. Although, and it's a book, I don't know, Bryce, I know you're a fan of, of, of uh, Friedman. He's written a book on the Exodus, and I actually heard him give a couple of lectures, including one very recently on the subject, and he claims the Exodus actually absolutely did happen. A group of, of Israelites, he thinks it's the Levites, left Egypt and went to the Holy Land, but certainly not the way it's described in the Bible. So in terms of the Bible, that's pretty much where, where I come down, that in terms of, am I reading actual history? Probably around David and the kings after David, there's good reason to believe that there's history. The earlier uh, language in Torah and Bible, I think of as our sacred myths. And my guess is there are, there are grains uh, of history in there. I don't think these things arise, you know, out of, out of, thin air oh, no. and i think a lot of it is of course the unfortunate truth of you know humans don't get to understand it all until we get there ourselves but also one quick little question just in regards to what you were saying how uh there was proof of god regarding making humans which checks out to me why does he or i guess this is kind of a bigger question too that I, you don't have to answer right now but like why does God still try so hard for us? It seems. Oh, you know, the problem that is confuses me. <laughs> me not into temptation because my temptation is to discuss this. But um, so God is the most interesting character in the Bible. What I would say is the Bible is the story of the evolving relationship between God and humanity. But you know, I would say we you can raise this one on one with me. Or maybe in one Sorry, of our, I definitely our, no, am no, a no, bit no, no, no. Yeah, I, I, there's just no way I can cover the material. No, you're good. My brain was more active than okay. I thought. I was half asleep two seconds ago. <laughs> oh, good. Well, I'm, gl I'm glad you're uh, woke to coin a fair phrase. Um, so Jerusalem. Now we're getting into some history because the 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 text says, and I think there's historical evidence to this that David conquers the city. But according to actually the Bible, he is not allowed to build the temple in Jerusalem because, uh, as it's explained, he's been a man of war and it should be a man of peace that builds the temple. David's son is Solomon. His Hebrew name is Shlomo, which means his peace, probably God's peace, uh, P-E-A-C-E. -E. So, so Solomon builds the temple. And then there's some really interesting stories about David taking the tabernacle, the portable tabernacle, and actually bringing it into battle. And there's an interesting story about the, the tabernacle is captured by the Philistines and they get an interesting disease and no one's quite sure what the disease is. Um, so there's, there's all kinds of interesting stories in the Bible uh, about that. But then Solomon builds the temple around 900 BCE, before the Common Era. That temple is destroyed in 586 BCE by the Babylonians. Where Babylon is where Iraq currently exists. And then Babylon is conquered by Persia, and King Cyrus uh, allows the, the uh, Israelites who want to leave to return to build the second temple about 80 years later. And it is a pale imitation of the original. There's text that say the people that had seen both of them, um, you know, wept when they saw how poor a substitute the second one was. And then as, as uh, Israel, uh, Judah, comes under the control of the Romans, King Herod is a fantastic builder, 
and he rebuilds the second temple. It's not considered to be the third temple because he didn't build something that was destroyed. He just greatly expanded the temple. And I'm going to have lots of pictures to show you uh, that. And then, uh, then uh, around 30 BCE, and then about 100 years later, the temple is destroyed by the Romans. So I know this is kind of hard to see. Again, these slides are on my, on my, uh, on my website. This is a, a, an artist imagining of what Solomon's Jerusalem would be like. So uh, a royal complex, the temple. This is called the City of David, although it's certainly not clear what role David had in it. And there's some astounding excavations going on right now in the City of David. Uh, again, here's another rendering about how magnificent uh, Solomon's temple uh, might have been. And then Herod rebuilds it. And there's a couple of things here. I, I, I'm, there are many things I'm obsessed with. This is one of them. So Herod basically expands what we call the Temple Mount, Har Habait. Um, and actually, we know from excavations that took place 150 years ago or more that this area is sort of hollow. It's supported by arches. And one of the issues is a priest can't enter a cemetery, a place where there is death. And so there was theory that in much of this area, it might have been a cemetery. So there's an air gap between where the people would have been buried and where the floor is. And this area is still pretty much intact as an elevated area. Clearly, the, the buildings that, that stood are no longer there. And I'm going to point out some interesting elements of this. I'll, I'll just point out a few right now. Here is the stairway. This is the southern wall. Uh, there's two gates. Uh, this is Robinson's Arch. This is Wilson's Arch. And this area is where the Western Wall it would be today. So there's a wonderful model, which is now at the, um, the Israel Museum. Uh, and these are just photographs. I'm pretty sure these are photographs that I took. So this is the Western Wall is on the other side. This is the Eastern Wall. Uh, and here is uh, the photograph. And I, we, I don't know if this is me or someone else has labeled again, the gates. And I, I love this area because I'm going to show you some pictures of how these stairs exist today, what Robinson's Arch looks like today, Wilson's Arch. And then there were Roman things, Roman theaters, maybe a stadium uh, and, and a fortress. And then there is the, the temple. So this is Herod's rebuilding of the temple. So this is something I'm fascinated with. Here is Robinson's Arch. Why do we need an arch? Because there's a city here and then there's a valley running here so it goes down and then up it's hard to see here so basically there's roads going across and um ways of getting in the temple without having to go all the way down or i think robinson's arch actually can help you get from street level up into the temple so this is robinson's arch as it existed in herod's time in 1967 when the israelis um took control of the old city, this is the way the arch looked, namely the buildup of just stuff, you know, dirt over 2000 years had reached the bottom of this arch. And then this will give you a sense of the excavation since 67. So this was ground level in 1967. Wow. And there's a tremendous amount of, of excavation that's, that has taken place since then. Um, so this is Wilson's Arch. It's kind of on a bridge going into the Temple Mount. This is the Western Wall that exists today. And so here's Wilson's Arch. So only the very top of the arch exists. And then on, this is all on the men's side of the Western Wall. And there's kind of a, a, a sort of an amazing uh, prayer space uh, underneath uh, the arch. Uh, again, this is the way the Western Wall looks today. There is a, a mosque. Uh, the Al-Aqsa Mosque here, the, the Dome of the Rock is over here, and there's a men's section, a women's section, and a bridge. This is where tourists can enter the Temple Mount. At times when tourists can enter the Temple Mount, Muslims are allowed to enter through uh, other gates. And then there's a, uh, it's, it's kind of controversial these days, but there has recently been built a prayer area near Robinson's Arch. The, the traditional Western Wall is considered to be a synagogue. So the Orthodox establishment has control over it. So there's no mixed prayer of men and women, but Robinson's Arch 
is, um, is uh, a place where uh, I would say conservative and reformed Jews can and do pray. And I've led services there um, and men and women together. While I'm in Israel, I just wanna briefly introduce the other holy spots there. Um, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which as you'll see is very much in the neighborhood, is the holiest spot in the Christian world. It's the plausible site of the crucifixion. Uh, there was debate about it because it's outside the city wall, um, because there's a law in Judaism, you're not allowed to bury someone within a walled city. And if you go to the, you know, to the old city today, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is clearly within the walls of the old city. So there was debate about whether it really was the crucifixion site and the burial site of Jesus. Uh, but as they did more excavation, they realized that at, at Jesus' time, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre was indeed outside of the city walls. And in fact, Jewish graves have been found in the church. Um, and it was the site, another thing that gives it credibility is it was a site of a Roman temple in the Emperor Constantine's time. Constantine lived in the fourth century and he sent his mother uh, to Jerusalem and supposedly she discovered uh, this site and the true cross, uh, Queen Helena. And the, it was Roman practice to build their temples on the sites of pre-existing holy places. Um, so this is, this is the way the area would have looked in the time of Jesus. And a Calvary, the word calva, uh, I think in Latin probably, or Greek, probably Greek, means skull. Um, the Aramaic name is Golgotha. And so the church is built on this site. There's the Golgotha rock. This is the way the church looks at the moment. Um, again, here's the main entrance to the church. I, I don't have time to talk about the latter, but it's really an interesting story. And of course, Helena found a grave and said, this is Jesus' grave. And over the years, they have built up a very fancy structure surrounding the grave. Okay, also, the third holiest spot in Islam is the Dome of the Rock, built in the year about 700. So that, that, uh, that building's been around for, for 1,300 years. And it's built over rock, which we'll see in a moment is according to Jewish mysticism, the site of the creation of the universe, according to Jewish tradition, is the site where Abraham took his son uh, Isaac to be sacrificed. And according to Muslim tradition, it's the site where, Mos where Muhammad uh, left this world on his night journey on the back of a flying horse uh, to ascend uh, into heaven. It's not technically a mosque, but it is the third holiest spot in Islam. So here are some shots, very familiar. And the gold has only been up there, you know, for, I don't know, a number of decades. So it wasn't always gold. And of course, on Muslim holidays, it's filled with people. So here's the Western Wall, and there's the Dome of the Rock. Inside the Dome of the Rock is a rock. And um, so you can see it. it Maybe it's a little hard to see, but parts of the rock are chiseled out. And scholars have actually identified where the Holy of Holies stood on this rock. I have a, another um, uh, set of classes, four classes on my website called Children of Abraham, discussing Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And the fourth session in that class is an extended tour of Jerusalem. So if you're interested in the subject, I recommend that to you. Uh, How are they able to figure that out yeah. sorry exactly where he stood how do they figure it out yeah so uh I, can you see the chiseling in here yeah yeah so there's a dimension of one of the areas which is exactly what the dimensions are of the um of the uh ark of the covenant and uh you know i i i will if you check out that that discussion there's some explanation and then i can also recommend a book if you're really obsessed with it uh, by archaeologists who have okay. really focused on this and thank you and it, it's 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 astonishing what you can learn you know and the other thing that's sort of in, very interesting about this rock is it's hollow so there's a prayer area underneath it so what we see in jerusalem today the walls including the western wall is not 
part of the temple. It's part of the retaining wall uh, of this big square area that Herod built. We see gates and stairs. The, why the Western Wall is so holy is there's, there are traditions that it was built by the common folks, money raised by and workers raised by the, the common folks, whereas the rest of it you know, was taxation and Herod taxing the people to, to build it. Um, but it's also the area, it's the closest area we can get to, to the Holy of Holies. So it's, it's you know, the subject of a, a place of intense uh, prayer. And it's also been exposed for the entire last 2000 years parts of it. So Jews have traditionally worshiped there. The Church of the Holy Sepulcher has been rebuilt several times because it's a, there's it, uh, Jerusalem is seismically active, so there have been earthquakes and fires, and I mentioned the Dome of the Rock. Sepulcher. Yeah, oh gosh, yeah, I can't get that, so Hashem knew. Sepulcher, sepulcher, I, that's going to be a problem for me. Fortunately, it doesn't come up all that often in conversation, except here. <laughs> what, um, is what is that? Uh, sepulcher is, the definition of a sepulcher is a grave without a body in it. Oh. So the Church of the Holy Sepulcher is Jesus' grave, but Jesus ain't there. Uh, again, if you're Christian, he's not there because he was resurrected and ascended into heaven. If you're like the rest of us, when you find graves in that era, it's quite common that no one's there. Okay, I want to move on to the subject of synagogue. The word synagogue is actually a Greek word. Um, it is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Beit Knesset. Beit Knesset means house of meeting. The, the Israeli parliament in modern times is called the Knesset. And the Hebrew word for synagogue is Beit Knesset. Uh, the synagogue is not a temple. Again, the temple in Jerusalem was a place where you sacrificed animals. You took animals and other things to sacrifice to God, to a priest. The priest would then sacrifice the animals. There were areas where everybody could go. There were areas where only Levites could go. There were areas where only the priests could go. Um, a synagogue is not a temple. Um, we, we do find synagogues as houses of worship, study, and meeting in temple times. Certainly, uh, you know, I, I think the concept of synagogue starts taking hold in, um, you know, after the first temple is destroyed because the Jews are going to keep, uh, the Jews are going to want to stay Jewish and they can't get to the temple or they, the, or the temple is destroyed. So they are going, uh, they create a house, a place to study sacred text and meet. Those are, are, are called synagogues. Um, and the, the idea of using the word temple to describe a synagogue, um, you know, the, the, the temple, in, the synagogue in Thousand Oaks is called Temple Adad Elohim. Uh, for the, in very large part, that term is used by the reform movement. And there, I think, in the traditional world, you would never call a synagogue a temple because you wouldn't want to confuse the role of temple and the role of synagogue. I would say in reform movement, um, pretty early on, the reform movement, I would say, gave up on the idea of wanting to rebuild the temple and having a third temple. So they weren't shy about calling our places of worship temples. And I do know that there are conservative synagogues that also call their uh, their places of worship temples. The key elements in a synagogue, and I hope uh, those of you who are, you know, who are not Jewish and uh, will have a chance to visit a, a synagogue, but the things you will always find is an ark, and typically when this, the synagogue is supposed to be laid out so that when you're facing the ark, you're facing Jerusalem. Um, there are Torah scrolls, handwritten copies of the first five books of the Bible in the ark, in this, you know, in this closet, I guess you could call it. There is something called a ner tamid, and tamid means continuous. It doesn't mean eternal. I can tell you that uh, the light bulb does burn out from time to time, and there are blackouts, and the, the light doesn't continue. This is not Hanukkah. 
there is typically a bima, which means an elevated place from which either prayer is led or uh, the Torah is read. And then there are prayer books and places to study and teach and, and so on. Some of the issues that surround a syn the synagogue world is the role of music. Um, tr in a traditional synagogue, you may have people singing and chanting, but typically you won't have musical instruments. Certainly in a traditional synagogue, uh, you wouldn't have electricity used on the Sabbath. And then they, they won't even typically use uh, guitars. And my understanding of the reason, and it, it seems a little silly to me, is um, the, the, first of all, you can't transport things on the Sabbath, technical issue. I think we'll get into some of these in a subsequent class. But the fear is if you broke a spring, you might, a string, you might be tempted to repair it and you can't repair it, things on the Sabbath. I would say certainly in reform and conservative synagogues, there's, uh, there's a sound system and there are, uh, there are musical instruments. Um, in, a, in a traditional synagogue, Orthodox, and I would say many, if not most, uh, Sephardi synagogues, basically traditional synagogues, men and women, are seated separately, and there's either a symbolic or a significant barrier between men and women. Uh, symbolic, it may be a very low uh, sort of fence or, or partition between the men's side and the women's side. Um, and then in other synagogues, you know, the women are completely in a separate room and there may be a screen in which they can see the service. It's quite common in large Orthodox synagogues that the women's section is a balcony. Uh, and then in very small synagogues, there may not be a women's section at all. I, have, I think I've led the only reform service in the kingdom of Morocco, a synagogue that was built by Sonia's uh, grandparents. And there, there was no women's section at all. The women would sit outside. If they really wanted to hear the prayers, they could hear them from the porch. And in the service I conducted, I think it was the first, maybe the only time women have ever been in that synagogue during prayer and it was kind of interesting to me almost well it was very interesting to me that the women refused to sit with the men they still say it in, in one section um, so that's an issue and it has to do with modesty and it's interesting to me that that's also true in islam men and women are seated separately in uh in uh, mosques during services it's it's interesting to me that i don't see that so much there may be places uh, but by and large, Christianity doesn't observe those rules. One of the things that many of you will be familiar with is the issue of funding congregations. In the United States, typically congregations have some sort of dues structure or suggested dues structure. And it's always very controversial uh, about, you know, do you have to, do you, you know, pay to pray? Um, and, but actually I've had this conversation with, with some of you individually Anyone can attend any regular service, uh, and you shouldn't even feel shy. I mean, for those of you that are studying for conversion, you should feel absolutely free to attend a service. Uh, you know, back hopefully soon you'll be able to attend uh, in person. And I would strongly suggest you, you know, you mention to the rabbi either before or after services that you're you're studying for conversion and. I, I hope that you would feel extremely welcome. Um, the only counterexample to that is some synagogues during high holidays, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, will sell tickets. And it's, a, it's, a, it's fundraising. And so you may be seeing people get, getting tickets. I would say typically for folks for whom attending services or synagogue membership would be financially burdensome, Synagogues are always willing to work out an arrangement, uh, and you know, hopefully, you get in touch with someone who uh, who handles that uh, appropriately. It's not always true. One of the issues in Israel is the, uh, as I think many of you know, the only uh, movement that's officially recognized in Israel is the Orthodox movement. So, until recently. Orthodox synagogues were the only synagogues that had government support, so there were no dues. Uh, the rabbi was paid by the, by the state of Israel. 
the building, and it, they typically wouldn't be very you know fancy buildings except for the major synagogues, also uh, paid by the by the state of Israel, and then reforming conservative congregations. Uh, would have to basically raise the money through international Jewry or, uh, or by dues. So that, that made it and continues to make it difficult to inform and uh, conservative Jews in Israel. There's some movement on that with some support uh, in Israel for liberal uh, rabbis. So just some shots of synagogues, beautiful synagogue in Florence, Ooh. magnificent synagogue in Florence. Uh, the only thing it lacks is Jews. Um, and then just some that I've served. This is a synagogue in Bozeman, Montana. Uh, here's Casablanca, Morocco. Um, and actually the Bima is not here. I'm not sure why it's not configured for the Bima. This is actually Sonia's. No, this, this, yeah, this I think is, yes, this is the one. Oh, I'm actually taking the picture from the Bima. So I'm standing on the Bima facing. It's, it's very small. Um, and here is Guatemala City. So this is where I was a couple of years ago. This is it for the, the prayer room. It's in a house. So this is the big room. You know, might get 25 or 30 people for high holidays. Um, is that Sonia? No, that's not Sonia. This is Rebecca. And uh, she is the president of the congregation. And she is now a rabbinic student uh, in, in her first year of study in Israel. And this is a picture of the Bima. Uh, I'm sorry, the Ark. Uh, in uh, Guatemala City. Okay, so that's synagogue. Any questions, comments about synagogues before I move on to the home and kashrut? Okay, so the home. So the idea here is bringing spirituality into the home. And some of you have studied before, with me before, you'll see I have some themes that I'm going to be repeating. And I love this quote from Harold Kushner. The question is not how can I be more Jewish, or the problem is not how can I be more Jewish. The problem is how can I be more human in a world with challenges and difficulties? Judaism is not the problem. Life is the problem. Judaism is an answer. It's the answer for Jews. I often speak in praise of organized religion. Organized religion has lots of problems, but if the purpose of religion is to make the world a better place, uh, and that certainly is the purpose of Judaism, then why not organize? Um, you know, as I, as I sometimes say, if, if the Red Cross needs blood, some of us individually could stand out on a street corner holding a sign saying, please give blood, or our synagogue could organize a blood drive. You know, people need food. We can each go door to door collecting food and then go door to door asking, is anybody hungry here? or we support food banks. So I would say I am absolutely in favor of organized religion. And I like the idea that religion requires us to do these things. The word mitzvah doesn't mean good deed, as it's often translated. The word mitzvah means commandment. So we're obligated to do these things, whether we feel like doing them or not. Um, the theology that you will often hear is that with the destruction of the temple, the rabbis reformed Judaism. I often use those words very deliberately. And one of the concepts is to make our homes, what is called in Hebrew, a mikdash me'at, a small tabernacle or a small temple. Uh, so there are rituals that went on in the temple, you know, in a, a, uh, of, of showbread, so that challah takes the place of, of that. Um, the, the breads were salted. In, in temple time, so traditionally we put some salt on the challah. We wash our hands now in our in our homes before we eat. It 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 it's a, a you know a, a aftershock or a remembrance of the priestly washing their hands in in the temple. So so this is one of the things that's going on. Our temple is supposed to be small sanctuaries. So the question is, how do we make our homes and lives more holy? So. Be thinking about that. Maybe when, after I finish the presentation, you know, you can add your thoughts to to my own. So here's some ideas that work for me, and that is taking God and I would say Torah and Jewish literature and Jewish law more seriously. And by that I mean seriously, not literally. 
uh, we started talking about this a bit uh, in response to Mick's question about you know historicity of, of text. So these stories are serious. Um, you know they 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 are our foundational stories, and as such, they deserve our attention. They're the foundational stories of Judaism. If Judaism is an important part of your life, you ought to understand its foundations, and the foundations are in these texts. Whether you believe the texts are literally the word of God, inerrant, and so on, is another question. But 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 I would say I don't know how you are seriously Jewish and ignore the text. As I said in the very first three classes, uh, first class and then the first three classes of this program is about God, Torah, and Israel. A serious Jew is one who seriously grapples with God, with Torah, meaning Jewish sacred literature, and with Israel, meaning the land of Israel and the people Israel. For me, it's very powerful when I get a sense of being God's tool, becoming God's hands to help and comfort. And these times can be very difficult, but they are, uh, they are awesome. And I don't use that word lightly. Uh, I always think back and very early in my rabbinate, the 16 year old child of one of the founders of our temple was killed in a car accident. And you know, there I am with a family trying to comfort them. And, you know, words are coming out of my mouth. And I'm terrified going into this situation because it's very early in, in, my, in my career. Um, and I just feel like I am channeling God. Now, that may be a, a psychological uh, gift or problem that I have, but there is no question that I felt that. And there is no question that that's what was going on. At least there's no question in my mind. I often talk about, again, what happened in, in my life, and that is bringing God into your speech, namely acting spiritual. And in my own case, what happened was I would act spiritual, and I talk about God and Judaism and so on. People think I'm spiritual and expect me to be spiritual, and sure enough, I become spiritual. And the other thing is I would say, don't worry about this. Don't be don't make yourself crazy. I, I often talk about the following image. <sighs> I, I don't think I have a slide on this, but imagine you are now in the arms of the person that will be become your major, the major love of your life. And it's a first dance or hug or, or whatever. Um, and there you are. And it's, it's just magic. Now, if one of you starts worrying about, well, what are the, you know, what are the biochemical, neurological uh, basis behind this attraction? Is it pheromones? Is this having to do with, you know, Darwinian evolution? If you really start wondering about that, your partner is going to be looking for another partner pretty soon. So what I would say is when you're praying, don't worry about praying. Um, um, theology is to prayer as a menu is to a meal. I love theology. I love talking about it. But there's a time to just pray and feel connected to God. Just like reading a menu is interesting, but there's also hopefully, you know, time to actually eat lunch. Bryce. Yeah. So could you give us a better idea of what becoming spiritual means in in terms of behavior, because that's what you've always stressed. Yes. That what Jew Judaism about is about is not belief, but about what you do. So what is... So I would say... Ju I've, just, I've just, always just, thought of spiritual as being internal. So yes. how is that manifested okay. by you? So, so just I want to clarify, Judaism certainly values belief, but the emphasis is on action. So for me, spiritual is a conscious aligning with God's will. And as a Jew, I understand God's will as aligning with Jewish law. So I visit the sick. I comfort you know, people who've lost people in their family. And I might be a nice person and do that before, but now I absolutely feel commanded. And the difference for me about Jewish spirituality is 
I feel commanded to do it whether or not internally I want to do it or not. So the thing, the thing that I like about religious spirituality is that it makes demands upon us. And the way I often compare it with pure spirituality, whatever that means, um, is you go out in the woods and you have this wonderful moment, you know, the, the sun is coming up, you feel at peace, you see, you know, little Bambi uh, drinking water, the birds are there, the brook is there, uh, everything is fantastic. And you feel at one with the universe and you feel spiritual. Mazel tov. Now what? Okay. Do you feel as a result of that, I have an obligation to help I would say other people, animals, and the environment. Do I have, have I been given a gift by God and now I'm in, do I have a moral and do, do I have a moral, moral and spiritual obligation to share that gift? That's to me what spiritual means. Different people are going to have different uh, definitions of it. Um, so, uh, I would say exercise your spirituality. I don't know if right brain, left brain, I keep reading articles every now and again, people say this, this is nonsense. Exercise your spirituality. How do you do that? Adopt some ritual practices. Judaism, particularly in the reform world and the conservative world, um, it's pretty easy to say, well, we don't do any of that sort of um, you know, old fashioned stuff. I mean, we had in our Monday night discussion, we were talking about, you know, covering your head. Uh, so there are things which are purely ritual that aren't directly ethical. And I encourage you to experiment with them. And even though they may not make sense um, to you, experiment and see if it enriches your life. See if it gives you a better connection with God. Praying with a talit, um, lighting Sabbath candles, having a an observance of the Sabbath, uh, celebrating the end of the Sabbath with Abdullah, daily prayer, the Shema, but also <clears throat> speaking to God. I've, I think I've talked about speaking to God and listening for a response from God. I would say start observing the Sabbath in some way. If I were an Orthodox rabbi, I would give you a long list of things you, you must do and must not do. Uh, but as a reform rabbi, I would say Start making the day unique and different. There's a tradition of blessing the, your children. And one woman I know um, blesses her children who are adult uh, and living in various parts of the world. And she does it every Friday night as the sun sets. And no matter where her kids are in the world, they know as the sun is setting in Southern California, their mother is blessing them. Um, don't work or modify your work practice. Um, don't watch TV. These are just suggestions. The Sabbath makes times holy. TV literally kills time. Most, many of us watch TV to kill time. So do something, I would say, to make the Sabbath a holy day. And then get into a habit of saying baruchas uh, of uh, wine and bread. My favorite one is Osema Asevere Sheet. I talked about that in the in the, uh, in the prayer book se session, um, recognizing every time you see something, every time you eat something, even, you know, I talked about the bathroom prayer. Every time you notice that your body is working the way it's supposed to work, stop, notice it, and thank God. And thanking God always should carry the, the price tag of needing to pay back God's children for the gifts that you have been given. Okay, so kashrut, and that's one of the subjects today. So the word kosher, it's a Hebrew word. It means fit or appropriate. So, um, you know, if you have a mezuzah, there is a kosher mezuzah. It means it's, the scroll is handwritten and it's hung in the, an appropriate way. And then you can get, have a mezuzah that has a, you know, a Xerox copy of a scroll that would not be kosher. Uh, there's a kosher talit, the, the tzitzit are tied in the proper way. You can argue there are kosher rabbis, there are non-kosher, you know. The, so the word kosher applies to more than simply food. Um, even today, you know, as, as Jewish 
uh, idiom have invaded uh, English, I would say, you know, you will hear people say, uh, this deal doesn't seem quite kosher to me. And I don't think they're talking about in accordance with Jewish law. But, it, but it's an appropriate way of using the Hebrew word kosher. So here are the basic rules of keeping kosher. Um, some of the rules, and I'll call your attention to which, are laid out in the Bible, and some are added by the rabbis in the Talmud. So in terms of meat and fowl, for meat, what is required for an animal to be kosher is it has to have a split hoof, kind of like you know, two fingers, um, and it has to chew its cud. Um, certain animals eat grasses. They, I don't even know if it's two stomachs. I think it is two stomachs. The food is regurgitated, chewed again a second time, swallowed, and then goes into a second stomach. So for an animal to be kosher, those are the rules in the Bible. This is not Talmud, this is Bible. Um, the Bible doesn't tell us why those are true. One of the things we'll notice is all, the, all of the land animals that are kosher are by and large vegetarian. Now, maybe they eat bugs and things, so maybe oh, yeah, not, yeah, yeah. not vegan. Um, uh, and then I'll just cover the fowl. And the fowl, there's no category, but there's a list of prohibited fowl. Um, and then, the, so that's all in the Bible. And then in terms of fish, uh, only fish that have both fins and scales are considered kosher. And then in the Talmud, the rabbis prescribe kosher ways of slaughtering animals. Um, and those are land animals. Um, land animals and, and, and fowl. Uh, Mick. Sorry, I only briefly caught, you said that basically a lot of like kosher rules apply to vegetarians, but not necessarily veganism. So no, I've, no, no, I, 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 I Oh, sorry, no, what did you say on that yeah. part? I just didn't fully hear Yeah, that. yeah. So if you're a vegetarian, you are eating strictly kosher. Cool. Okay, there is nothing in vegetarian that is not kosher. Um, what, what I was saying is that I, I often observe that none of the animals that we eat are themselves predatory animals. Uh, so I was going to say animals, they're all, um, you know, uh, vegetarian, but chickens eat bugs. And, you know, so that I would say they're not vegan. That's, that, that's what I was saying. Yes. Quick question. If you're a vegetarian, you are keeping kosher. Quick yes. question. So I actually have been vegetarian since I was 14. Hello? The thing I run into that's hard for me is, is gelatin. Uh, and I know gelatin can be a mixture of animals that are hooved. So where does gelatin fall under? Okay. okay. It's a great question. My understanding is that gelatin is made of the hooves of animals, right? Uh, which makes it meat. So if it's the if it is made of the hoof of a kosher animal that was slaughtered in a kosher way, gelatin can be meat. But we're now we're going to get to the next item on my list here, which is mixing milk and meat. So in the Bible, three times it says, don't boil a baby goat in its own mother's milk. A goat? Hmm. Yes, a goat. Um, and we're never told why. Um, a scholar that I read once said it may well have been a Canaanite magical worship practice. And a lot of Jewish law is setting us separate from the Canaanites and idol worshipers. And that actually makes a lot of sense. What the rabbis do is they enshrine it as a principle, not only eating this particular goat in its own mother's milk, but mixing any meat with any milk and even something that might be confused with goat, I guess, like chicken or birds. You you are prohibited from eating even you know um, chicken parmesan. You can't have chicken with with cheese, even though the odds of that chicken being cooked in its own mother's milk, I can confidently say, is zero. Uh, we can talk about it afterwards in biology class uh, if there are if there's confusion on that one. 
Um, and then there's speculation that the rabbis were saying the essence of meat is death. If you're eating meat, something that was alive has, has to have been killed. And the essence of milk is life, mother's milk and so on. So the rabbis were keeping death and life separate, which makes some sense. Um, so the issue which often comes up, Mick, is not whether the hoof of the jello is from a non-kosher animal, but if you're putting whipped cream on the jello, because then you're mixing milk and meat. So there are non-meat gelatins, I think. There is vegetarian gelatin. My, yes. I'm a wimp with pills, so most of my pills are vegetarian gummies. Okay, yeah. So if, if you're vegetarian, you are kosher. Uh, and so food is generally in three different categories, meat, dairy, and parv. Parv means neither meat nor dairy. Uh, chicken, I'm sorry, fish, all fish um, are parv. So you can have fish with a meat meal and with a dairy meal. Uh, eggs, you might consider should be meat, but they're not. Uh, they are parv, so you can have eggs with meat or dairy. And um, there are organizations that determine whether a given food is kosher or not kosher. And so you will find, I should have a picture of this, but if you look at some of the packages uh, of food, if you see, typically a K with a circle around it, a U with a circle around it, and then it will often say uh, parv if it's parv. Uh, a funny incident once happened, I was working, I've worked for a number of Israeli companies and we were in the desert and a bunch of Israelis are, are working in the desert on this big, huge solar project and some of them are Orthodox. And this is not so far from Barstow where, where most of the guys would stay. And one day uh, it, was, it was told to me that some of the guys came very excited and say, we found a kosher store in Barstow. This strained <laughs> the credibility of, of the person who was listening to it. And he said, really? He said, what's it called? He said, Circle K, the whole store is kosher, including the bacon <laughs> and the pork rinds and, and so on. So that's kind of, I can't pass a Circle K without thinking of that story. So, um, there's rules which I think are, are a little crazy, in my opinion, about wine. The issue with, you say, what could be non-kosher about wine? It's made from grapes. The issue is whether that wine may have been used for idol worship. Anything that's used for idol worship cannot be used in Jewish practice. So if there's a suspicion that somebody may have worshipped the idols with this wine, then... Uh, you can't use it. Um, so the way this translates, and I'm not an expert on these rules, but basically, certainly the wine, the wine bottles, the wine manufacturing, and I would say in some cases, if you're really being ultra kosher, even handling of the grapes must all be done by Jews. Um, and for some reason, don't ask me why, uh, if, if that isn't the case, because the problem is, we're talking about people carrying the boxes, the waiter bringing the bottle of wine to your table, uh, the person stacking Manischewitz bottles, you know, in the supermarket. For that wine to stay kosher, that, that person has to be Jewish. And as you can imagine, people aren't doing that. So there is something called mevushal, which means literally means boiled. I think it means flash heated. And for some reason, the rabbis decided if you heat the wine, you are removing the pagan cooties from the wine. Yeah. Um, and I won't you know, dignify it with anything more than that. So if you look at most wine bottles you find in any store anywhere, you will see the word mevushal. I've never seen it translated as boiled or flash heated. Um, and it may be in Hebrew only, or it may be in English letters, but that's what's up with that. So what are some reasons to be kosher? And I encourage you to experiment with keeping kosher. For one thing, it elevates the animal activities of life. So we are animals and we are, we are you know, the, the Torah text says, God said, let us make humanity in our image. As I've mentioned before, one of the elements of this that I like is God was talking to the animals. So we are animals 
and but we're also in we're in the image of animals we're also in the image of god so one of the things that's going on behind the scenes in judaism certainly in a lot of religion is trying to separate and elevate activities which would which would otherwise just be animalistic and eating is one of them an animal eats anything it can physically digest humans should artificially restrict what we eat um, it's one of the very little known elements of kashrut you're not supposed to eat standing up uh, oh. to be strictly kosher um, as your mother would tell you sit down and eat like a person um, that's part of kosher law um, why why because animals eat standing up people sit down it's oh. again separation of of these things Again, that's my interpretation. Uh, I don't it's certainly. I don't know. I, I don't know in the Talmud if 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 that's expressed. Um, also, to be conscious that living things were killed, and so that you could have a meal, um, and then to remind yourself you're Jewish. If you do nothing else, if every time you sit down, you wonder, you know, is the pork in this? <coughs> Am I mixing meat with milk? You are underlying the fact that you're living a Jewish life. And there's also an element of keeping the culture together. This isn't so true today, but if you think back in the old country, you know, a Jewish peddler would come to town. Uh, there either were no inns for him to stay at, or if there were, they certainly wouldn't be kosher in this little town. So um, if he's going to eat, he's got to find some home to eat with. Uh, and he goes to eat there, he may stay over, and he meets, you know, the, the young lady of the house, and they get married, so it's one way of keeping Jews and non-Jews separate. If I can't eat with non-Jews, there's a much lower likelihood that I'm going to meet and marry non-Jews. Um, but the other element, and I'll talk a little more about this, is making the everyday holy uh, and noticing it. You can be religious in the way you approach a business problem, in the way you eat lunch, in the way you write your checks, not only in the way you read the Bible, go to shul, or read Torah. So here's one. I know some of you have seen this before. And this is sort of my, my exercise of holiness in the supermarket. So you enter the supermarket. And, you know, if you're busy, you're in a rush. I know I have to stop off at the supermarket tomorrow. You may be complaining, I've got to do this. You know, things are expensive. I'm rushing through it. But here's the, my thinking behind this. Notice that in a world where a good chunk of humanity, probably more than half, doesn't have adequate nutrition every day. I think it's only 40% of people have regular access to clean water. 40% uh, don't have access to clean water. In a world where certainly historically, you know, what we sort of euphemistically call food insecurity, which is really more hunger and starvation, were facts of everyday life, you now have entered a world where almost every conceivable food is clean, organized, and laid out before you. Um, That's what I said. Uh, there's you know, bottles and cans, and they're all facing the right direction, and, and everything is just fantastic. And I, I'd love to, you know, to talk about the produce. Instead of you going into the, into the field and picking your broccoli, the broccoli is sitting right there. Every now and again, it gets spritched. And if you're really at a fancy <laughs> supermarket, they will even play thunder. So the broccoli thinks it's still growing, and that's how fresh it is. The broccoli even thinks it's still growing, but it's clean, it's processed. It's, it's, it's you know, it's in little bags. It's not in little bags, you know, whatever you, you want. And so I, you know, I always uh, talk about my mustard sermon. One year, one year I was asked to give a, I think it was a high holiday talk. And it was, um, I, I took this one step further. I went to my local Gelson's, which is a high, upper end supermarket in Southern California. And I counted how many choices I had in mustard. And as I said here, 
I, probably I could be perfectly happy if I never had mustard at all. Certainly if I only have deli mustard, I'm a happy guy. So when I went preparing for this sermon into my local Gelsons, I actually counted 39 choices oh, of wow. Grey Poupon, you know, crazy, rough cut or fine cut and so on. So a few years later, I was giving another sermon. I couldn't repeat the mustard thing because so many people had heard of it. So I decided to do one on olive oil. So I went <laughs> to Whole Foods Market to count the number of choices of olive oil. And I emphasize, I'm only talking about olive oil, not sunflower oil, not safflower oil, not God forbid Crisco, but only <laughs> olive oil. So how many choices did I find? 92. 92. Now, some of the big bottles and some of the little bottles, but these are choices. There's spiced, flavored. I always am mildly amused by virgin and extra virgin. I have yet to see slutty olive oil. Um, so I, I don't know what's going on with that. Uh, the foodies out there, actually, I actually, it's crazy. it really is going on with it has that. to do whether it's the first press or not. Yeah, that's what they all say. But how do we really know in olive oil and others? You know, there's a God, I shouldn't say this. There's a, a joke I heard um, saying they're lying about their virginity. Exactly. There's a, a young woman uh, is is with, you know, her boyfriend and 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 he, I'm saying it's only for the purposes of olive oil, you should understand. He's with a boyfriend and he asks her, so, so tell me the truth, am I your first lover? And her response is, why does every guy ask me that? So how do I know the truth about these virgins, uh, virgin olive oil and extra virgin olive oil? Okay, so other ways other than mustard and olive oil. Uh, but, but seriously, going back here, the idea is, I would say what, what, uh, what Abraham Joshua Heschel would call radical awe and amazement. Think about the idea that God so loves you, not only do you have olive oil, but you have 92 choices of olive oil to make. <laughs> now the question is, what's our response to being so gifted? And in Jewish tradition, and I would say also Christian tradition, different theology, but leading to the same place, is you are obligated to give back. You know, in terms of giving tzedakah, in terms of giving funds, the word tzedakah comes from the Hebrew word tzedek, which means justice. And the idea is a certain amount of the stuff you have doesn't belong to you. It's been entrusted by God to you to make sure people who need it wind up getting it okay so yeah so here that this is uh uh other things sadaka always gives something a jew that does not give sadaka is not just selfish he or she has committed an act of injustice a, there is a long discussion of lashan hara i have a uh i'm pretty sure i have this talk posted on jewish ethics and basically it's evil speech the idea of sticks and stones can break my bones, but words will never harm me is absolutely not in Jewish tradition. Words are very powerful and very significant. You know, what could underline that more than the idea that God created the universe with words? Judaism talks about eliminating idolatry. So the question is what are idols and what are modern idols that we worship? And I would say it's the, the works of our hands, our jobs, cars, bodies, career, uh, cell phones. Uh, in the modern world, the question is not who owns our body, but who owns our souls and who owns our time. Uh, isn't the prototypical busy executive really a slave? Um, the, you know, the kind of a standard understanding at, at funeral times is no one ever on their deathbed regretted that they didn't spend more time at the office. Uh, study and reading. When I pray, I speak to God. When I study Torah, God speaks to me. And wherever you are, there are synagogues and there's Torah study going on. We have a wonderful Torah study at Temple of Dar Elohim, 8 a.m. Pacific time, 8 to 8.45 Talmud, 8.45 to 9.30 Torah. If you don't have the link, 
You can either go on the Temple of Dada Elohim website. It's actually much easier if you just ask me either by email or if I get a chance, I'll look at chat uh, and I'll be happy to send you that, uh, that website. Is it virtual or is it live? Yeah, it's virtual. I mean, oh. th there have been times when it has been live. Uh, I, I will post right now in chat the Temple Adat Elohim Zoom website. Hang oh. on. Thank you. And here it is. Uh, I got to make sure I don't send it just to one person. Okay. Yeah, so there's the website. Uh, you can copy it. And, uh, and and it's a wonderful it's a wonderful study. And typically, I'm not responsible for leading it. I step in. I am a major kibitzer, but many of you are here tonight uh, routinely uh, join us on Saturday mornings. And then I would also say, be Jewish for yourself, not the kids. There's a story in one of the texts I read about um, a guy that goes, I don't know if he goes to the rabbi or something, he says, I pray that my kids um, may be Jewish, or it's my wish that my kids will be Jewish. And the, uh, the rabbi says to him, if you behave in that way and really focus on making your kids Jewish, you will hand down that tradition. Namely, your kids won't be Jewish, but they will pray that their kids are Jewish. So the idea is be Jewish for your own self. Yes. The biggest way you can impress your children about the power of Judaism is for them to see you practicing Judaism, not to, for, the, you know, for them to see you sending them to Hebrew school and you basically ignoring Judaism. And then the emphasis of, of this discussion is to start uh, a, a maxim I learned as a, as a management consultant is don't make the best the enemy of the good. There's a couple of different ways to say that, but don't feel like you have to all of a sudden become orthodox in your practice. Experiment. For me, I, for years and years, I would take on one new spiritual discipline every Jewish New Year in terms of kosher laws I observed in terms of prayer and tefillin and putting on a yarmulke and so on, I would experiment and I encourage you to experiment uh, with these forms of spiritual discipline. The word for Jewish law is halacha. It means a path. It's not where you are, but where you're going. I think that's it. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing and uh, just open the floor for discussion. Anything? No, no yeah, and anybody have anything they want to ask or say? I have a question about the synagogue in Florence. Right. Was, was that built like way back in the, uh, I don't know, the same time that Florence was built? And are, is it just like a small, like there's, a, there, is there still, has there been like a, a congregation Continuously there, except during yeah. like you know, I vi I visited there probably thirty or forty years ago, and there was a small active congregation. I don't know. I'm sure you know. Some of you maybe at this moment are googling it, so you can see <laughs> when it was built, and it may have been expanded and reconstructed. But it looks like a you know, it looks like a magnificent cathedral. And I've also visited the synagogue in Budapest. And same thing, tiny, tiny congregation, um, huge, beautiful building. Um, so I, but I don't know the history um, of the Florence Synagogue, Ryan. So I was chatting with my wife and, and she said that it was frowned upon in, in more traditional um, practices for um, someone who's Jewish to go into a church or mosque or any other house of worship because of um, idolatry and things of that nature. Yes. Yes. So um, it's absolutely true. I would say in the Orthodox world, um, you're not supposed to go into a church. Um, I think even in the synagogue for my congregation in Camarillo, uh, which we share our space with a church, that, you know, Orthodox Jews will not go in the building because there's a cross on it. <laughs> um, the, um, 
and I think in some Christian traditions, you have a similar prohibition. Uh, I know that Pope uh, John Paul II was the first pope to visit the synagogue in Italy, which dates back to, uh, you know, to ancient times. Um, so so the, there's, there's that prohibition on both parts. I certainly don't recognize those um, prohibitions, but you're absolutely correct. Jamie. Um, I just was wondering, um, just uh, from when you were talking about the temple in Jerusalem, the pictures of it architecturally made it kind of look like it wasn't really available to the public. I just wondered, is that the case? Or could the people like go to the temple, kind of like how a synagogue is open to the public now? Yes, yeah, so they could go and they would be restricted from going into certain areas. So there was, I think there was even a court of the Gentiles where anyone could go. I think you may have had to go to a mikvah before entering the temple grounds. I'm actually not certain about that to be spiritually cleansed, or it may just be the sort of the inner sanctums. Um, but there were definitely places for men, for women, anyone. There was a woman's court. There was a men's court. There was a place where only Levites could go. There were places that only the Kohanim, the priests, could go. And this is actually true in the Greek Orthodox churches, where anybody can go into a Greek Orthodox church, but there's a screen, and only priests are allowed behind the screen. And of course, in the Holy of Holies, the, the holiest place in the, um, in the uh, temple, only the high priest could enter that chamber, and only on, on Yom Kippur afternoon. So there was a hierarchy. It's a, it's a good question. Uh, Rabbi, isn't it also fair to say that, you know, for a sacrifice, they were at that time, they were required to come to the temple? Um, I actually don't know the answer to that. I do certainly, well, let me put it this way. On the pilgrimage holidays, which is Passover, Sukkot, and Shavuot, they are called pilgrimage holidays because you were required to go to Jerusalem. So I would say, yeah. yes. Uh, I, yeah, I, yes. So certainly for those holidays, in fact, in Hebrew, they're called the shlosh regalim. Shlosh means three, regalim means feet. So it's, you're hoofing it to, uh, to Jerusalem. Um, yeah, um, I'm going to, I'm actually glancing at some of the chat. There were some very good questions. Uh, Bryce asked the question, does God care if the scroll in the mezuzah is Xerox? God knows. I don't know. Um, I tell you what is defined as a kosher scroll. I can tell you for some people, it's very important. And for some people, they will even inspect the scrolls uh, every few years uh, to make sure that the scrolls aren't damaged. So actually, because I'm going to be talking about this in a couple of days, I just happen to have some scrolls. So here is a kosher scroll. And because it's, you know, it's vellum, uh, it, so it's, you know, very small. It's, I know that this won't focus so well, but it's handwritten on the, on the skin of a kosher animal. And, you know, um, because it's, it's sacred, um, the rabbis are going to define what's the appropriate thing to do. Ryan, you asked, um, I think exotic animals. Yeah, that's you. Um, yeah, so, so if you come, if you find a new animal that ungulates, is that, uh, that's the word for uh, uh, choose its cud. If it has- well, That would be a ruminant. The ungulate is, ruminant. The is the hooves. Oh, okay, okay. No, didn't know that word, thank you. So, so if you have an animal that has split hooves and choose its cud, that animal would be kosher if it was slaughtered in a kosher way. Um, the, this, this becomes really interesting with sea life because there are certain, I think the sturgeon, I think the sturgeon has, they, the sur a sturgeon has fins, but I think only uh, a young sturgeon has scales and as the sturgeon matures, it loses its scales, or maybe it's the other way around. I actually don't know. But I know that there's a controversy in the rabbinate about whether sturgeon are kosher. 
um, because it has scales in certain times of its life. Does that mean you can eat it at that time of its life, but not the other? So this is why there are probably 20 different, there are 20 different organizations that certify kashrut. And so they, they may have different um, requirements. There's a really interesting one if you're really kind of obsessed, interested in Jewish law. And that is, suppose you grow meat in a Petri dish. Suppose you take, we'll start off with the easy one. Suppose you take beef and you start with some beef cells and you grow the beef, you grow the cells, and now you have beef. Is it kosher? Um, clearly, it's coming from an animal with both split hooves and and you know and 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 uh, choose its cud. But that animal, th the stuff you're eating, was never alive in an animal. What's even more interesting, and this is the subject of of some discussion in Israel. So actually, one question is. So that's easy level number one. Now we're going to dig one level beneath the surface. Is it meat? Which is to say, suppose I grow meat artificially in a Petri dish. Can I mix it with cheese and have a, you know, uh, can I have mixed meat and milk? And there are rabbinic authorities who would say it's not meat, so you can have it with milk. Then let's take it one step further. Suppose I grow pork this way. Suppose I take cells from a pig and I grow pork. Is the resultant bacon kosher and is it meat? And there are Orthodox authorities in Israel. I don't think that, I don't know how widely accepted this ruling is, but there are Orthodox authorities in Israel who would say it's not meat and it's not, since it's not meat, it's certainly kosher. So you can have, you know, a, a ham and cheese omelet if the ham is made in a Petri dish. And actually some of this thinking may well be connected with the legend of the golem. I don't know, some of you will know about the legend of the golem. This is a story from Prague where a rabbi by saying some magic words and putting God's actual name on a clay figure animates the figure. And there's a great story. And, um, but I've heard that being referred to by rabbis to justify um, things like cloning, um, making artificial things that improve life. So Jewish law is alive and vibrant, and I find it you know, extremely interesting. Um, uh, Marlene. This may sound bizarre, but it's but in the news a few weeks ago, they did a heart transplant with a pig's and thinking outside the box, if this happened with an Orthodox Jew, would they not be able to do that because that would be bringing a uh, pig into the body? I mean, I mean, yeah, I, 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 I think I think this kind of thing has been discussed. And to the best of my knowledge, there's no objection to it because you're not eating it. Well, the, restriction on, the restriction on pig is eating it, not on using it. Is um, that a matter of interpretation? I mean, eating everything's it a matter going of interpretation. into the body. Every, everything's a matter of interpretation. So the, well. so the issue is, if this is done, there would be a formal uh, question asked of a body of rabbis and the, the, you know, the leading scholars of different communities would respond. That's what responsive literature is about. I don't know if that's been addressed in responsive literature, but, but it doesn't matter what your logic is, Marlene, or my logic. The question is what actually governs? And you know, my guess is the issue is whether you eat it, not whether you use it. So it's okay to play football with pigskin and, and so on, um, as long as you don't do it on the Sabbath. That's my guess. Now, I don't know if the rabbis have ruled about that. By the way, I think Islam treats the restriction on pork even um, more severely than does Judaism. So there, I think it would be considered offensive to Muslims. But, but you'd have to ask an imam. 
to know if that that were the truth. Uh, but it's a very it's a it's a very good question. Uh, any other questions? I was going to say that you're not supposed to. Uh, I mean, a Muslim would not want to be to to touch a pig. All right, and and in fact, one of the things that was uh, done during the Philippine War back or back in the uh, eighteen in the nineteen hundreds was that to discourage the uh, the Muslim rebels, they would they would bury Muslim uh, dead Muslims in pigskins. Mm. All right, and as a form of psychological warfare. Yeah, and I've also heard legends, I actually don't know if they're true, about, you know, coating bullets with pig fat and that being, again, particularly offensive. So, again, you, you'd want to talk to a Muslim scholar on this. But, but my sense is that what you're saying, what you're saying is true. Okay. Uh, Ron, you are not muted. So if you have something. Oh, uh, well, just a simple question about, about fish, uh, like a lobster has no fins and no scales, but it comes from the ocean. So is that considered a fish or some other kind of animal? Oh, that's a very good question. Yeah, if it lives in the ocean, it's a fish. Um, so not kosher. The question is, you know, what category does it fall into? Right. It, it, it's not a bird, so it's not on a list of acceptable birds. It doesn't have split hooves and chew its cud, so it wouldn't fit into the category of kosher meat. There is, a, there is one kind of insect, apparently, that's kosher, uh, but by and large, insects are not kosher. Drawn butter makes it okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I never know why people want to eat lobster. This is a statement about my palate. That's uh, a joke. And lobster. Chinese food on Sunday night is absolutely fine. Triple and on Christmas. What? Yes, just, just not lobster. Um, <laughs> I don't understand why people eat lobster. My, 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 I'll confess to having tasted it. I don't think it has any taste. The only taste is the drawn butter. Save yourself from the fires of Gehenna and a few bucks by just dipping good sourdough bread in the, uh, in the drawn butter. So, um, so. Uh, Mike, uh, uh, Mike, how yes. about shrimp? How about shrimp? No. Oh. No. Shrimps, uh, and I can tell you, you know, that not I have kosher. conducted weddings where the couple is very focused on the ins and outs of Jewish law. And we're walking back to the cocktail hour after the wedding. And the first thing you see is a raw bar with shrimp and oyster and yeah, shellfish. No clams, no, no shrimp, clam, no yeah. octopus, no yes. calamari. Yes, yes. Nope. So if you want to have a triple trafe pizza, Pizza with pepperoni and calamari. Ah. <laughs> That's just nasty. Yes. Uh, Don't bacon forget the bacon. Tell you about the trace banquet. Yeah, so, the, so thank you. And I'll, I'll, I'll call on others that have their hand up. So one of the legends of the reform world is the so-called Trefa banquet. Yeah. And when Isaac Mayer Wise founded Reform Judaism, and the three institutions that, that make up Reform Judaism today, namely Hebrew Union College, what was called the Union of UAH, the Union of American Hebrew Congregation. Now it's Union of Reform Judaism. And um, CCR, the Central Conference of American Rabbis, uh, he envisioned creating a uniquely American form of Judaism that all American Jews would participate in. And the story goes, well, the story is true. The, the underlying motivation, we don't know, is at the first ordination of rabbis uh, from Hebrew Union College in the 1870s, this was in Cincinnati, which was the Wild West at the time, they booked the nicest hotel in town to have a dinner, and there were rabbis that came from all around and clearly there weren't many reform rabbis because this was the first class of reform rabbis. Um, so there were some reform rabbis, but they were, you know, they were Orthodox rabbis. Apparently shrimp cocktail was, was the appetizer. <laughs> and no one knows, and there are copies of the menu. Uh, no one knows whether that was, he was, whether he was making a deliberate statement 
or whether it was an accident. Uh, but this basically guaranteed that not everyone would accept Reform Judaism. My, my own version of that uh, was one year, actually this is before I was the rabbi in Camarillo. Uh, apparently they would always have Passover meal at a local venue. And I guess one year everybody got hysterical because uh, the salad was served with croutons, namely little you know, pieces of bread. So that made people hysterical. There are examples also in the conservative world of them serving a, uh, you know, having a meat, di meat dinner. And then there was non-dairy creamer. But when people started reading the details of the non-dairy creamer, it seemed like there was, I don't know, ret I, I, retin? I, I can't even remember what. There was a meat product in the in the creamer and everybody went nuts. Uh, Mick and then Ryan. Um, and I just wanted to, to I just wanted to clarify when you said that, why was David not allowed to build the temple? So according, I, according to the book of Chronicles is because he was a man of war and okay. the temple should be devoted to peace. Follow-up question. Mm -hmm. Then if the Messiah, according to, because I was, as you know, raised Catholic, if the Messiah, according to Judaism, is supposed to be more strong, to my understanding, more of a leader of like war kind of, how does that figure? So the Messiah is supposed to be a king of Israel. Okay. So political or, or military leader. Um, it, it's a very good question. Would the, would a, if he were a military leader, would he be allowed to build the third temple? Um, we will find out when the Messiah comes again. Uh, and also, quick last question. Yes. I actually just don't know this. Is the Messiah, according to Judaism, male? Is that like... According yes, because a king, king, according to traditional Judaism, king, king uh, not queen. Uh, Re Reform Judaism espouses the idea of a messianic era, not an individual messiah. Very good questions. Uh, Ryan. Uh, so I'm curious, um, imitation lobster. So it's actually made with a fish that has fins and scales. So yep. is it yep. kosher? Or? Yes. So the question, one thing is to see... <laughs> look on the bottle i had to go grab my bacos you should you should look on the bottle <laughs> and see if it if it has a kosher certification uh because it might well be that some of the flavorings are from crab as so if the flavorings are from crab uh, then that would be an issue then just to make life a little more complicated there's a concept called marat ayin marat means the marat. evil or the bitterness, like maror is bitter herbs, ayan is I. Whoops, I'm trying to see. Um, so, um, so marat ayan means you don't do something which would be perceived as violating Jewish law. So a classic example of this is a rabbi was going to appear on a TV show, and then he found that the TV show would be aired on the Sabbath. So even though they were taping it on a weekday and it was perfectly kosher for him to tape the show, he didn't allow, you know, he wouldn't do it because of the perception by some that, um, that he was working on the Sabbath or violating the Sabbath. So for things like Bakos, um, you know, again, I, I don't keep strictly kosher. So I don't worry about this, but if, but, Many, many authorities would object to imitation crab or bakos because of this, uh, this issue with, uh, with it appearing to be non-kosher. What's bakos? Ba bakos are little artificial bacon chips, but they're not made with bacon. Oh, I love bakos. Them. Oh, yes, oh, okay. yes. Sorry. <laughs> and then to make life even more complicated, if the impurity by volume is less than 1 60th. And I would say if it's not deliberate, it's okay. So if you have a little bit of bacon that fell into your vat, or what would be more likely is a fly, you're making a big bat of beef, beef stew, and a bug lands, as it, lands in it. The bug is not kosher. Does the presence of the bug invalidate the kashrut of the entire stew? No. no. 
Suppose a drop of milk falls into it. The answer is 1 60th by volume. And 60 was the unit uh, in Babylonia. That's why we have 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, except on Passover. Any Passover impurity invalidates the whole thing. That's why I went to rabbinical school for five years. <laughs> so I don't know if Mick or Drew, you have your hands up or it's just, you didn't take it down. All right, Drew. You're muted. Thank you. So uh, to make uh, that whole thing even more confusing and complicated. I've, <laughs> I love Jello. I've done a lot of research on cash root for this specifically. Um, some people hold that if uh, a substance, a non kosher substance changes what you're eating, um, then the whole meal is not kosher. So it doesn't matter if it's less than a 60th, if it changes the characteristic of the food, like, like rennet used to um, mm. uh, turn milk into cheese, uh, then it is also not kosher. Yeah, so I have no idea, uh, but, but that sounds plausible to me. Mm. Um, <laughs> and I like it because it makes it more confusing. Uh, can I say one more thing? Sure. Okay, according to Wikipedia, there are uh, four different kinds of locusts that are considered kosher, and those are the only insects that are considered kosher. Okay. They're uh, desert locusts, red, yellow, spotted gray, and white. Okay, so if you ever invite, I know we're neighbors, if you ever invite me over for dinner, I am <laughs> going to double check <laughs> that you're only serving kosher locust. Well, they would they would have to be hors d'oeuvres. <laughs> What's the matter? You cheap with the locust all of a sudden? <laughs> I chocolate want on anything. You know. I want locust parmesan. <laughs> okay. the, 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 they're kosher because there was could have been times where that was the only thing to eat. Well, right? if it's the only thing to eat, then you can eat anything. All right. Okay. Good yeah. Point. I I don't know. I, I absolutely don't know why these would be kosher. Okay, gang, it's been fun. Um, you know, I meant to do this on Monday. We ha we just celebrated the holiday of Tu Bishvat. Yeah. Okay, so everybody tell me your favorite Tu Bishvat song. Say what? Okay, the that's favorite. why. That's a good point. Yes. <laughs> so, wouldn't you say the world is crying? Are you crying? going to sing again? Yes, I'm going to close by singing my Tu Bishvat song. Okay. Oh, um, and I'm trying to think. Well, I think you'll know most of the terminology. So, I was asked to write a song for a Tu Bishvat Seder, and I struggled and struggled and struggled, and then it hit me. Tree for two, for two Bishvat. It's a chag, about which we don't hear a lot. If you were a tree, you'd be jumping for glee for <laughs> two. Bish fat. The trees on two, on two bish fat. Would love to run and dance, but they're rooted and so they cannot. It's up to our mishpachas to make the fuss and for two. Bish fat. It's the new year of the woods, a day to feel grateful for all of our wood and goods. The Seder comes later, we thank the creator for two bish fat. Yes, you, on two, on two bish fat. This two bish fat, confess that you almost forgot, but by singing this witty refrain, you and your aging brain will recall <laughs> it all. <laughs> and so when we eat an apple from the tree or orange or avocado, we say bore peri, bore peri ha eats. We bless and thank God it creates the trees. Happy to Bishvat. Sorry it's a couple of days late, but happy to Bishvat. And I look Thank forward, uh, just for those <laughs> of you that good. sometimes join me on Thursday nights, I remind you we are not having a class Thursday night. Next week uh, on the 26th, we're discussing life cycle, Brit Milah, B'nai Mitzvah, marriage and intermarriage, divorce and funerals. I think you have too much free time.